mute their speakers, that'd be helpful. Uh, uh, Krishna, I really appreciate all the kind words you said. That's what happens when you've been in, you get old enough, <laughs> you collect enough things. Um, and, uh, uh, but I've been very grateful to have a, a really exciting career in this field <clears throat> and to be involved in some really interesting topics during my career. One of which I wanna talk to you about today. I'm gonna share my screen. Does everything look okay on your end? Is that good, Krishna? Good, I'll assume it is. Uh, I'm going to talk about bentonite polymer composite geosynthetic clay liners, a different type of clay, uh, GCL that are used for containment of highly aggressive leachates. And we'll see why they're used for highly aggressive leachates in just a moment. A couple of points just of information as we begin. I, I have a bunch of things I'm referencing in the uh, webinar today. All of those documents will be on a file share. I put the link to that file share in the chat. It'll also be at the end of this PowerPoint. Uh, that will be populated later today. Don't look at it now. It's just an empty folder, but it will be filled later today. I wanted to make sure that was something we were able to do before I filled it. Uh, but look for that. And I guess the other thing I would say about this work today uh, says a lot about why we do research and why we do experimentation. These uh, BPC GCLs, which are actually used throughout the world now, uh, two major US manufacturers and others around the world manufacture these for commercial applications. This all came out of a, a NSF industry academic research project that we began almost 20 years ago. And the technology we're gonna talk about today was something that we found out by accident. We had a research project around a hypothesis that was completely wrong. And we stumbled on how these materials behave, the mechanisms behind them, almost by accident through experimentation. And really from tremendous insight of one of my former PhD students, uh, Professor Joe Scalia. Uh, so I, there's a lot of folks that deserve credit for the work here today and I'll, I'll mention them at the end, but Joe was one of the instrumental people in um, defining this technology, which is very common in practice today. Let's just talk a little bit about geosynthetic clay liners. It's, these are really pretty remarkable materials. On the left here, I show a conventional barrier system with a composite liner at the bottom. And I'm gonna put my laser pointer up. Ah, wonderful. A composite barrier at the bottom, a composite liner with a geomembrane, typically about a millimeter and a half thick and underlain by a, a compacted clay liner that may be anywhere from a half a meter to more than a meter thick, depending on where, uh, where you're working. Uh, that's a very effective system. It's also a very intense system to build and very expensive. And we can get uh, comparable, if not better performance using a different system by replacing that compacted clay liner with a eight millimeter thick geosynthetic clay liner, a very thin uh, uh, barrier beneath the geomembrane, right here, a very thin system that we can install much more quickly at similar or lower cost, expedite construction, uh, and more importantly, because it's factory manufactured, we can minimize defects. Here's just another schematic of uh, a GCL, a couple of photographs on the right, they come in a roll, almost like a carpet. Uh, relatively thin, this is a dry GCL, a relatively thin one, but again, we're replacing this relatively thick composite barrier with a thin GCL and a geomembrane and saving all that space, that airspace, saving construction time and getting something that actually functions better. If you look at the field performance data for composite barriers with a GCL, they function equal or better than, and usually better than, composite barriers with a compacted clay component. So we actually create something that's better. And we developed a lot of experience with these materials <clears throat> uh, working with the municipal solid waste landfills. They started getting used in the early 1990s. We'll talk about why they work so well for municipal solid waste, but also some of the challenges of using these products uh, with other types of waste streams that generate leachates, which are much different in chemical composition than uh, uh, municipal solid waste leachate. 
But let's begin to talk about why a GCL works the way it does. I've got a typical cross section in the upper right hand uh, corner of my slide here, which shows a blow up. It's, it's, it's not a photograph. I have to admit it's an artist's rendition of what a typical North American GCL would look like. A GCL manufactured with just granular sodium bentonite. We'll have two jet textiles, non-woven typically on either side. They'll be sandwiching uh, a layer of bentonite on the order of about three and a half to six kilograms per meter square in dry mass of granular uh, bentonite. And it'll be needle punched with these fibers that are uh, dragging through the system to provide some shear resistance. That cross section itself doesn't look very impermeable. In fact, it looks very permeable. It looks like we have sand particles constrained between two jet textiles. And if that cross section was maintained, that pore structure was maintained, that GCL would not be an effective barrier. It has to transform itself. And it's that transformation when the bentonite hydrates that is really the magic that makes conventional GCLs work. Uh, that material that may be a uh, with this granular example I show here, or a powder bentonite, that bentonite will swell and form a gel like I show down here in this photograph at the bottom. That transformation from a particulate material to a gel, which really has microscale to nanoscale pores, is intrinsic to the functioning of these materials. The, a GCL will have very low hydraulic conductivity if it swells. If it doesn't swell, it will be much, much more permeable. And we have lots of evidence around that. So when we look at uh, GCLs with conventional bentonite, this is the mechanisms at play. These are the granules I show here in A. And if they swell in the GCL and close the inner granular pores between them, we'll have very fine micro scale flow paths and very low hydraulic conductivity. On the other hand, on the right, if the uh, sodium bentonite granules do not swell due to the geochemical conditions that in the leachate to which it's exposed, those inner uh, uh, granular pathways will remain open. That's a, a much less tortuous, a much broader pore, side, pore to flow through and the hydraulic conductivity will be much higher. So conventional GCLs will work well in a condition that simulates A on the left where we get lots of swelling but not so well in cases like B where the granules don't swell. Now, why is that? What, what's going on in conventional bentonite? This is important to understand about why we use BPCs, GCLs in certain applications. Well, uh, bentonite is essentially 80 to 90% montmorillonite clay mineral. And montmorillonite clay mineral is a two to one mineral made up of two silica tetrahedral sheets sandwiching a gibbsite octahedral sheet. That's what I show here. And they form stacks. So I've got a stack here of one uh, 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 composite, another uh, montmorillonite sheet, and they're stacked on top of each other. But what's important is that those individual sheets are not fixed in their bonds. The bonds between these sheets are very, relatively weak and when, during hydration, water molecules can make their way into this inner layer region. That's what we call that, the inner layer region. And as you can imagine, as more water molecules move into that region, the sheets will begin to separate. That's, that's what makes bentonite swell. That's the magic of bentonite. And we often describe that swelling in the clay mineralogy literature as a D001 spacing, essentially the spacing from the top of one silica tetrahedral sheet to the top of the other. Um, and we'll, we'll be using that number in a minute. But what's pr uh, pretty remarkable is, is the amount of surface area that's involved. If the sheets separate, the surface area is on the order of 800 meters squared per gram. That's remarkable. That's all being a, uh, water molecules being associated with 800 meters square per dry gram of montmorillonite. That's equivalent per gram to 1.6 US football fields. That's an enormous amount of surface area. That surface area is charged, it's negatively charged, so it's highly reactive with polar water molecules. It's affiliating with those water molecules. And so you can imagine we have a charged surface, it's got huge surface area, uh, and it's gonna be highly reactive with the 
uh, water that associates with it during hydration. Well, uh, back actually way back in the 1950s, uh, there was a lot of interest in the swelling of montmorillonites nights and bent nights in particular, not so much for environmental applications, more for agricultural applications and trying to understand conditions which allowed drainage of water and which didn't. Uh, and a professor named Norrish back in the 1950s published a classic paper describing how bentonite, the swelling of bentonite and how it varied with the geochemistry of the solution of hydration and the uh, cations that affiliate with that mineral surface. And he showed some, uh, a graph like this that uh, was really instructive. Uh, like many of us who are engineering professors, we're always trying to manipulate our axes to be able to create linearity. Uh, and he had some pretty crazy ones as we'll see here in a minute, uh, but bear with me as we talk through them because this makes a lot of sense. So he looked at that D001 spacing, which today we could just talk about as swelling, all right, swelling, uh, increasing swelling at, on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, he had one over the square root of the concentration. So zero is highly concentrated, 10 is much more dilute. And so as we go from left to right, we go from infinite concentration to infinitely dilute. And I've shown that here on my graph that I have concentrated on the left, dilute here on the right. And what he showed is that the propensity for swelling varied significantly on two important factors. One, the concentration. As the concentration went up, uh, the swelling went down. That's uh, influencing what's called the osmotic component. He also showed that the amount of swelling depends on the valence of the cations, that we would get so-called osmotic swelling, and that's really the, the uh, significant swelling of bentonites with monovalent cations. If the solution was predominantly divalent, the swelling was much more muted or so-called crystalline swelling, uh, and uh, swelling was much more reduced. And so we typically in concentrated or divalent conditions, we reside over here with very little swelling, um, dilute conditions with a, a very significant amount of swelling. We can see this in, in some illustrative uh, photographs really clearly. Uh, go from that complex graph to some simple pictures, which uh, say a, pic a picture's worth a thousand words. Well, this is really the, an example of it. These are some experiments we did years ago uh, with some of our very sophisticated geotechnical equipment like plastic kitchen plates and a plastic ruler, but very illustrative of what's going on in bentonite. These are old GRI GCL1 swell index tests where we would take the bentonite from a GCL and put it in the bottom of a CBR mold or a proctor mold for all practical purposes. So a thin layer of bentonite in the bottom. And then we would pour the liquid of interest on top of that bentonite. And we would then measure the amount of swelling of the cake of bentonite within the proctor mold. Uh, and we ran one of these uh, GCL-1 swell index tests with deionized water. That's what I show here in the upper surface, upper photograph. And so we've taken a sodium, conventional sodium bentonite, we put it in deionized water in the GCL-1 swell index test. And look at the amount of swell. We start off with on the order of about five or six millimeters of bentonite in the bottom of a proctor mold. We pour water on top of it, deionized water. It hydrates the bentonite and poof, the bentonite swells uh, tr tremendously. That's so-called osmotic swell in the deionized water. It's a very dilute solution, extremely dilute. And it has a sodium bentonite, so the cation is monovalent, lots of osmotic swelling. Let's do exactly the same experiment, but we use a 50 millimolar cal calcium chloride solution for hydration as opposed to DI water. Everything else exactly the same. Look at the difference in that bentonite after it's been hydrated. In fact, it virtually no swell, virtually no swell of the bentonite. Under identical conditions, all we did was change the concentration and two, the type of cation. And we've suppressed all of that swelling uh, 
simply by changing the geochemistry. And you can see in this little patty down below, you can see the remnant granules of bentonite. There's no evidence of osmotic swell. And in fact, that GCL is extremely permeable or that bentonite is. And whereas the uh, cake above in de deionized water is extremely impermeable. Nanoscale pores, macroscale pores, impermeable, permeable. Well, how does this translate into real world applications? Um, when we began to use GCLs originally, we were using them for municipal solid waste leachates. And actually they worked extremely well. And, and there's a good reason for that. And we look at two different parameters that, that really are, we talk about these as master variables that influence the swelling of bentonite. One is the ionic strength showed up here in the upper right. That's essentially a, the, an average concentration or a, a total concentration is a better way of reporting it of all the ions in solution. So a total concentration, ionic strength computed with this equation where CI is the concentration of the ith ion and ZI is the valence. And then another parameter that describes the relative abundance of monovalent cations relative to polyvalent cations with a numerator being monovalent and the denominator being polyvalent. In our early work, we focused on only divalent cations. We expanded it to polyvalent later on, but we've kept that D for the denominator, excuse me, for the subscript in the denominator in that, that parameter, RMD. And so when we look at leachates, we look at them in the context of these two parameters, ionic strength and the RMD, the liquid that we have to contain, the leachate that we have to contain, its geochemistry is gonna have a fundamental influence on how the bentonite swells. And we can capture that with these two variables, the ionic strength and the RMD. And if we look at these, going from left to right is more concentrated, high ionic strength, very concentrated solution. And on the y-axis, we look at RMD as we go from top to bottom, we go from uh, more monovalent to more divalent. So a lower RMD is a more divalent solution. And when we look at municipal solid waste, where our original fundamental uh, practice evolved from with GCLs, it fits right in the middle. Municipal solid waste leachates tend to have a whole bunch of things in them, uh, but they're not too concentrated. They are kind of nasty, but they're not too concentrated. They're right in the middle. Um, and if we look, uh, well, the other thing we know about them, they predominantly are monovalent. The primary cations are sodium and ammonia. And so we have uh, monovalent cations are predominant. The ionic strength is not too high. Works great for municipal solid waste leachates. And that's the MSW leachates are these tiny little black dots. I should have said that early on. That's from a database we developed years and years ago. And so that's our historic experience base. And then we begin to work with high aggressive industrial leachates. So one of the areas I work in is in low level radioactive waste. And in some of these waste streams, we, they may be similar in, in ionic strength, but they're very, very divalent because we use a lot of cementitious materials for long-term stabilization. So that's one example where we shifted out of our historic paradigm into a, a geochemical environment that tends to be divalent, which will suppress swelling of the bentonite. Conventional GCL will not work as well there as it does with MSW. If we work with other industrial liquid liquids like bauxite liquor, that's the liquor that's from refining of aluminum. That tends to be very concentrated, tends to be monovalent, but extremely concentrated. Uh, flow back water from uh, shale gas production also tends to be very briny, very concentrated. Incinerator ashes generate some very uh, concentrated leachates as well. Some hazardous waste streams uh, generate very concentrated leachates. And then some coal combustion product leachates, which many of us are dealing with these days, can be both, uh, both very concentrated and in some cases cannot be concentrated and divalent. Uh, not shown here, but they can be divalent as well. Uh, and so when we get into Industrial liquids, they're much different than municipal solid waste liquids. And they have differences which affect the ability of the bentonite to swell. So a conventional GCL will not be as effective. And when we begin to look at industrial liquids, we find that perhaps the most important variable is that ionic strength, the 
concentration of the of the leachate to be managed by the liner. Um, and many, uh, in fact, we're getting uh, uh, leachates in our lab right now, which have five molar ionic strength. They're like syrupy uh, leachates, extremely concentrated. And we see for a lot of industrial liquids, the hydraulic conductivity of a conventional GCL can be much higher than it would be with deionized water, MSW leachate. In fact, the more concentrated or higher the ionic strength of the leachate, the more permeable it is. So we have to have something else, something else that works in both cases. And that's where BPC GCLs come in. We take bentonite, and I give Joe Scalia credit for this wonderful slide. We take conventional bentonite and we add in a polymer and we create a composite. And I use the word composite because the materials we're talking about today depend on both the bentonite and the polymer to function. And we'll talk about why that is in a minute. They are bentonite polymer composites. There's lots of different bentonite polymer materials being used today. Uh, there's a lot of literature on this. Uh, and they come in different types of uh, uh, configurations. I'm, on the left here, I'm showing what we would typically think of a bentonite polymer composite. We have bentonite that's mixed with a, a dry mixed with a polymer. Both components, the bentonite and the polymer, will hydrate in solution and they will be in individual locations within the uh, GCL itself. We'll have bentonite clusters or granules and we'll have polymer gel surrounding them. That's very different than a other types of polymers, which actually affiliate directly chemically with the mineral surface, both on the exterior and on the inner layer region. These are so-called polymer modified bentonites or intercalated polymer modified bentonites. And in some cases, we'll actually uh, exfoliate the bentonite granules, separate out each of the uh, individual layers of the montmorillonite and wrap all of those with polymer. That's another type of polymer modified bentonite or an exfoliated polymer modified bentonite with the polymer chemically bonded to the surfaces of the bentonite. Our materials fit in this left category, composites. And they are composite materials because they're two different materials working together to achieve one objective. And they're made very simply. You take granular bentonite and you blend them with polymer particulate. In fact, in a GCL line that's used for production, there'll be a hoppers that will be distributing granular bentonite and there will be polymer particulate dropping into the system as well, creating a, a mixture that goes into the core of the GCL. Uh, the types of polymers depend on the application, the specific GCL product being manufactured. Some are so-called cross-link polymers, where the polymer chains are actually linked together by other uh, uh, bonds. Uh, there are also linear polymers uh, that are used, where we just have one long polymer molecule. They behave differently, both in terms of their ability to uh, uh, maintain low hydraulic conductivity, their interactions with uh, the geochemistry of leachates. We see here on the left, the cross links tend to be more granular or uh, uh, almost look like a, 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 a sugar. Uh, and on the right, they tend to be more liquid-like or gels. Uh, one, one common application of some of these uh, polymers is in baby diapers. That's perhaps a great example of a geochemistry cont a system, a containment system with extreme geochemistry that's particularly important in all of our lives. Well, in a GCL, uh, the polymer and the bentonite work together. And we see that here in the upper diagram. This is just a cross section of a hydrated BPC GCL. You see a lot of the bentonite here, but you see these uh, granules of hydrated cross link polymer. And in the lower photograph, this is with a linear polymer. It doesn't stand out as much, but we'll see some examples in, a, in just a moment. Actually, the polymer resides in between the swollen particles of the bentonite. This polymer gel has an important role. We talked about why the sodium bentonite doesn't work. That's because the inner granular spaces don't swell shut in the more concentrated or more divalent liquids. We need something to essentially plug up those voids between the particles. That's where the polymer comes in. These, you can think of a polymer gel as a highly viscous, viscous goop uh, 
that's essentially sitting in the pore space and clogging up the pores, preventing flow. Think of it like the bathtub uh, in your home and having some goopy stuff get into the drain and block that flow path and, and the bathtub no longer drains. It's the same type of thing that's occurring in a bentonite. That polymer hydrogel forms a relatively Im immobile and impermeable material, a net of hydrated polymer that blocks the flow paths. If we look at a, a micrograph uh, done with environmental SEM, this is a, a micrograph taken by QTN, professor at uh, George Mason University in the United States. He illustrated that uh, the bentonite uh, uh, granules in, in this particular uh, diagram are, uh, we have intergranular spaces between them. And you can see the polymer filling very nicely uh, between the bentonite uh, particles and plugging the pore space. We see it here, we see it here. It's that polymer filling those intergranular voids between the bentonite that's blocking the flow. So if we think of the mechanisms that are occurring in a conventional GCL, as we talked about earlier, we have granules of, granules of bentonite. And if they swell shut, that pathway is very tortuous and has very small cross-section and has very low hydraulic conductivity. If it doesn't swell, the intergranular pores remain open the flow path is less tortuous. It's got a much broader cross-sectional area and the hydraulic conductivity is much higher. In a BPC GCL, we're addressing that problem of intergranular flow paths that don't swell shut by filling them with a polymer gel. And that's what we see here in, in cross-section C. That polymer gel needs to be in that space for that GCL to maintain low hydraulic conductivity. And in fact, if the geochemical conditions are not appropriate and that gel actually mobilizes and flows out of that system, which can happen, we'll talk about that, we can have much higher hydraulic conductivity. Now what's important in a BPC GCL is actually two things are going on. The sodium bentonites or granules are swelling, but not nearly as much as they would in a, uh, in a dilute solution, but there is some swelling. Uh, and then we have the, the uh, polymer that's filling in between them. And so it's the amount of swell and the efficacy of the polymer to fill the void left by insufficient amount of swelling is really the key factor. It's two variables uh, that are important, but a very different set of mechanisms. Now you can imagine that this will only work if we have enough polymer to fill the void. So the polymer loading is gonna be particularly important and that's gonna depend in part on the geochemical conditions that are at play. If we have conditions that are really severe and they completely suppress all the bentonite swelling, we're gonna need a lot more polymer to fill that voids and to maintain low hydraulic conductivity. And that's what we illustrate here with this graph. This is hydraulic conductivity versus polymer loading of the BPC GCL. And you can see on the very left conventional bentonites over here, they're about two, almost uh, an order and a half more permeable than the other uh, lower conductivity materials here on the right. Uh, these are uh, GCLs permeated with a low level waste leachate, a low level radioactive waste leachate. And if we just add a little bit of polymer to those, like that's these blue uh, uh, symbols here. These are BPC GCLs with just a modest amount of polymer. It really doesn't have enough polymer to fill the voids. But if we get about four to 5%, the hydraulic conductivity really drops because we've got enough polymer blocking all the pore spaces. So the polymer loading is going to be important. We have to have enough of it. Usually it's about four to five percent minimum, but that depends on the geochemical conditions at hand uh, and um, uh, the, the uh, type of bentonite and the type of polymer. How well do these work? Well, let's look at if we have enough bentonite, uh, the type of conditions that we can achieve with a BPC GCL. Uh, this is actually some of the same data I showed earlier. Uh, this graph is hydraulic conductivity on the y-axis. On the x-axis is ionic strength. And it looks like just a jumble of data right now, but I will separate it out and illustrate it to you. The gray colored symbols or filled symbols are conventional sodium bentonite. All the other symbols are BPC GCLs and they're by different manufacturers. 
and they have different polymer loading. The polymer loading is shown here on the right, anywhere from 1.2% to almost 11% for this GP 10.9. And then this BPC uh, GCL, that's one of our early prototypes was around 15 or something like that. But if we look at the conventional bentonites with uh, the relationship between hydraulic conductivity and ionic strength, that looks something like this. This is that same set of data I showed earlier for industrial leachates. The higher the ionic strength, the more permeable it is. And in fact, if we just add a little bit of polymer, like we talked about earlier in the previous slide with low-level waste leachates, that's the blue uh, triangles here, we get the same result. We just don't have enough polymer in there to fill the voids. But if we get enough polymer in place, we get a very different system. That's this set of data shown here in blue. We get a system where the hydraulic conductivity essentially remains independent of ionic strength. Regardless of the ionic strength, I'm getting very low hydraulic conductivity up to a point, and then at some point it breaks. It gets too concentrated and the hydraulic conductivity jumps up. And we'll talk about why that is in just a moment. So we can get very different uh, behavior with a BPC GCL than a conventional GCL over a very broad range of conditions. We can maintain very low hydraulic conductivity because that polymer is filling the intergranular voids. But at some point, if the geochemical conditions get outside of an acceptable range, the BPC GCL will, be, will fail as well. And that's what we see over here. And they fail abruptly. They don't fail gradually like we'd see for a uh, uh, conventional bentonite. Now, why is that? What's going on? Well, the behavior of the polymer depends a lot on the geochemistry. And for example, the ionic strength influences how well that gel forms. So the linear polymer, you can think of that gel that we showed earlier. Think of just these polymer strands working throughout the uh, uh, liquid surrounding them, creating this viscous goo of, of, of material with strands in it of polymer that are essentially sticking to all different components in the pore space. That ability for the polymer to remain extended and have these very long polymer chains essentially fingers throughout the gel existing uh, tends to diminish as the concentration goes up. And in fact, as the concentration gets very high, this very ex uh, extended polymer molecule will tend to collapse or so-called coil, it collapses. And that collapsed polymer can be flushed out of the pore space more readily. So the effect of the geochemistry is important. Other things like that we normally don't think about for conventional bentonites, the anion ratio. What type of anions are present? Do we have primarily chlorides or do we have primarily sulfates in our leachate? If we have primarily chlorides, we tend to get more of that coiling or coalescing of the polymer. Whereas if we have sulfates, we get a very distributed polymer like I show here in the bottom photograph. You can see in the bottom photograph, we've got a highly distributed net of polymer chains. And in the GCL, all of those chains will be uh, affiliated with water molecules, creating this just viscous gel uh, clogging the pore space. That's what we get with a sulfate anion. With a very chloride-rich system, we end up with this coiled, compressed uh, polymer that doesn't fill the voids very well and actually gets flushed out pretty readily. And we often talk about the relative abundance of chloride and sulfate with the so-called anion ratio. So the anion ratio is important as well. And we can see some examples here just of hydraulic conductivity versus anion ratio, all other factors being equal. We can go from very low hydraulic conductivity with low anion ratios or sulfate rich solutions to very permeable BPC GCLs with chloride rich uh, solutions. And that will be, uh, depends, the relative sensitivity to the anion ratio depends on the cation as well. So the geochemical conditions are complex. I mentioned uh, as we change the structure of the polymer, it, it can uh, alter its propensity to get flushed out of the system. And one of the things that we see is under extreme cases, we will actually flush or elute that polymer out and that will create preferential flow paths. That's what I show you right here in a GCL. This is a GCL with BPC GCL ex uh, exposed in extremely strong leachate. We have a, a, the polymer that was in this intergranular space has been flushed out and 
leachate is flowing directly through it. And we've just used a little rhodamine dye to highlight uh, that uh, preferential flow path. And over here on the right, you can see the polymer flux, essentially the amount that's eluded relative to the hydraulic conductivity. As the hydraulic conductivity goes up, we see lots of polymer being eluded and vice versa. So the ability to retain the polymer is important. And we see this here in another example. This is another GCL where that was very permeable. We see that nearly all the flow in this particular GCL went through a very small patch or area that's shown here in this uh, essentially a pie piece number one where we see uh, purple staining where the uh, leachate was flowing through the GCL. And it also turned out that this particular pie piece had the lowest polymer loading. In this particular GCL, which was very permeable, the polymer was eluded at this particular location, more so in this location than others, and preferential flow paths formed and the leachate made its way through. So the BPC GCLs work well provided we can keep the polymer in the pore space or it doesn't get eluded. And that's really the challenging condition to be able to evaluate whether that will occur or not. Now, how can we evaluate whether that's gonna occur for our particular leachate? We know for a conventional bentonite, if we wanna get a sense for the uh, ability of that bentonite to function well with a leachate, we just run a conventional swell index test. It'll tell us how well the bentonite swells in, in the leachate of interest. And we can grow to a graph like this and it immediately shows hydraulic conductivity versus swell index. And I can see that if it doesn't swell much, I'll get high hydraulic conductivity. And if I get a normalized swell over about uh, 20 or so, I'll get low hydraulic conductivity. Very handy for conventional bentonites. These same type of simple index tests don't work so well uh, for uh, bentonite polymer composite materials. It's an example here of a whole plethora of data from our lab different and some others uh, where we've got hydraulic conductivity versus swell index of the uncrushed uh, BPC sample. And you can see there's no relationship between hydraulic conductivity and swell index. That's not surprising, right? That's not surprising because it's not swelling as the, the primary mechanism that's maintaining low hydraulic conductivity. It's the ability of the polymer gel to plug the pore space that controls the hydraulic conductivity, not the ability of the bentonite to swell. So we, we shouldn't expect uh, correspondence between hydraulic conductivity and swell index. You'll see some literature more recently that suggests that can be due to some bias in the D5890 procedure. Uh, we've evaluated that and found that that's not true. Uh, it's really the swell index is not effective for BPCs because it doesn't represent the mechanisms properly. We have to be able to fill the intergranular pores with polymer and that polymer has to be maintained. One way we've been looking at this, for example, is look at the ability of that gel to be mobilized in the pore space. We've been using a so-called uh, flow uh, stress measurement, which we measure in a dynamic parallel plate rheometer, which essentially describes the this, this shear stress at which a polymer gel will transition from a solid to a liquid. And so above the flow stress, the polymer becomes like a liquid and can be flushed out of the GCL. And we found that this flow stress is an indicator of uh, whether the hydraulic conduct, whether the uh, uh, bentonite gel will remain in the pore, stress, pore space and low hydraulic conductivity will be maintained. If we have high flow stress, essentially it takes a lot of shear stress to mobilize the, the polymer out of the pore space, we'll maintain low hydraulic conductivity. If the flow stress is low, then we'll, that polymer can be readily eluded. And that's what we show down here in these uh, photographs at the bottom. And that flow stress, uh, as you can imagine, is sensitive to the type of polymer, the water content that we're, we've achieved in the, in the GCL and the geochemistry. Unfortunately, flow stress itself is not an adequate, adequate uh, indicator alone because it's partly the, the uh, polymer component, but I mentioned early on, it, 
the polymer and the bentonite are working together. And so we need to account that for the bentonite granules do undergo some swelling. So we found actually that if we can take flow stress and uh, swell index together, swell index of the bentonite component and flow stress of the polymer component and bring those two measures together, we can create something that works very well. And I'll show that in the next slide. This is hydraulic conductivity versus what we call the flow swell index, which is just the product of the flow stress of the polymer and the swell index of the bentonite component, allowing us to capture the key components, the amount of swelling, which defines the uh, bentonite pore space and the ability of that polymer to be retained in that pore space under a shear stress. And we found albeit with a modest amount of data to date, uh, that this flow swell index we've developed seems to be a good discriminator for conditions that have high hydraulic conductivity, conditions where the bentonite granulars do not swell much at all, and the polymer tends to have low uh, flow stress that allows it to be eluded, as opposed to conditions where the bentonite swells more and the polymer has greater resistance to movement or higher flow stress uh, under, a sh under a shear stress in the liquid. And so this flow swell index seems to give us a nice step function of conditions that work well and conditions that don't. We've also been looking at aging uh, and service life of the, these materials. One of the great questions is how long are they gonna last? Uh, we've been doing these uh, time temperature experiments. This is just an example here of different polymer gels. Uh, these are all been moistened to 800% gel water content with a 50 millimolar calcium chloride solution and aged at different temperatures for two months or 60 days. And you can see a radical change in that polymer conformation over time. The leftmost is 20 days. The one you're seeing right now is 40 days, excuse me, 40 degrees and the rightmost is age 60 degrees at, at, at 60 degrees C for 60 days. So cool, warm, hot, and we see that the polymer is degrading more quickly at a more elevated temperature. So we're looking at that as a way of looking at, at the uh, uh, propensity to evaluate service life by understanding how the mobility of that polymer uh, changes over time. And you can see, that this graph just shows flow stress versus aging time. There are large changes in the flow stress that occur over time. And we're trying to develop some time temperature uh, methods to be able to predict service life using this type of data. So in the end though, ultimately we're gonna have to run tests to prove the efficacy of these materials. We're gonna have to run hydraulic conductivity tests like we do for other GCLs. Uh, this is an example here of a flexible wall permeometer conventionally used with ASTM D6766. Uh, a whole series of uh, uh, methods have been developed or, or procedures have been developed around testing with conventional GCLs. Most of those apply to testing with bentonite polymer composites as well. We have to pay attention to conditions like hydration, effective stress, hydraulic conduct equilibrium and chemical equilibrium. When we're doing this type of testing, we often run the test out to equilibrium. We're trying to make sure that we have both hydraulic equilibrium and chemical equilibrium. We look for steady hydraulic conductivity. We look to make sure that we've got a sufficient amount of flow through the system for chemical reactions to occur. We look for the flow to be steady as well steady hydraulic conductivity and inflow and outflow to be the same. And equally important, we look for comparable electrical conductivity, the influent and the effluent as a means to understand whether the chemical reactions between the components in the GCL and the leachate are, have reached an equilibrium state. And if the electrical conductivity, the influent and the effluent is roughly the same, that tells us the chemistry of the influent and the effluent are roughly the same. And we develop these all for conventional GCLs, but we don't know whether they'll be uh, fully uh, appropriate for BPC GCLs. Some of our data would suggest that's not the case. 
these tests take a very long time to run. Uh, they may, this is an example here of uh, some tests that were run for more than five years to reach chemical equilibrium. Uh, so be prepared. They may take a very long time to reach equilibrium. And even with the D6766 criteria, we may not uh, achieve equilibrium with the typical criteria that we have ex established. And that's what I've just illustrated here. This is a hydraulic conductivity versus poor volumes of flow. In this particular experiment, we ran it for a period of time. All the geochemical criteria were satisfied at this point. And we probably could have terminated then, but we ran it a little longer and you can see that it became much more permeable. So the geochemical conditions that we define for conventional GCLs don't necessarily apply for bentonite polymer composite GCLs. So we need to really run tests for a much longer period of time like I've shown down here in the lower graph. So just to summarize a few things. Uh, one, we, we, BPC GCLs can be really effective for many aggressive leachates. Uh, the polymer gel clogs the intergranular pores between the bentonite granulars, granules. Even if the granules don't swell appreciably, we can create systems that are very impermeable with a sufficient amount of polymer. Uh, the chemistry affects both the polymer and the bentonite. Um, the ionic strength, RMD, anion ratio, pH, all tend to be important. And both components are players. The, the objective is for the polymer gel to fill the pore space between the bentonite granules. As the jig chemistry suppresses the swelling, we need more work from the polymer. Uh, as the, if there's less suppression of swelling, the polymer is not as significant. It's the interaction of those two and the ability of the polymer to fill their intergranular uh, pores that influences what the efficacy of BPC GCLs. Uh, understanding that effective geochemistry is important. That knowledge is evolving. Um, it, the mechanisms that are in play are pore clogging in the intergranular pore space. That swell index, which we use so well for conventional GCLs, just does not work for uh, BPC GCLs. Be very cautious of using swell index as an indicator for BPC GCLs, despite some of the things in the literature. That flow swell index, which I talked about, appears to be a useful indicator. That's early in development. Uh, we had a paper this year in Geosynthetics 2021 with that data in it, uh, but it is early yet. Uh, I talked just briefly at the end here about hydraulic conductivity testing per D6766, our typical ASTM methods, our termination criteria in those methods are not necessarily applicable to BPC GCL. So we wanna run these tests as long as practical uh, and we should be looking for updates to D6766 over time uh, to address some of these shortcomings of the chemical termination criteria when these test methods are applied to BPC GCLs. And finally, remember, these tests take a long time, months. Sometimes I have some, I just looked at this morning in our lab that have been running a year and have not yet reached equilibrium. So you gotta plan ahead. Uh, finally, this issue of service life, as I mentioned, is something we're looking at uh, It's area of current research. Uh, that's a, you know, one of these big picture issues that we've gotta to come to deal with. We've been working on that for the last few years. So look for more on that as we go forward. That's my last slide of content, but I wanted to include this slide as well. There's a lot of people went into developing this technology over the last 20 years. This is just a list of, of folks at the top here that were students at one time, most of which uh, are now professionals in practice, and my colleagues Tunsir Edel and Bill Lykos at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. As I mentioned earlier too, all of the, this information will be in a file share for you to download the, the PowerPoint. Uh, if the video is available, we'll put that in the file share as well and all the supplementary information uh, too. So uh, we got a few minutes left. I'll take some questions. I got to find out how to get out into the chat. Oh, yeah. a lot of them. Great. Uh, so while uh, you are looking at uh, 
the questions in the chat box. Um, yes. I just want to make.